Don't be shy. Share us, uh, share us how you doing. Some people are joining in from, from Greece, 7 p.m. over there. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everybody. For everybody who just joined, welcome. It's 7.30 p.m. in somewhere. So it has to be somewhere close to Greece since it's 7 p.m. in Greece. Uh, somebody's asking, they call that they use a platform to use Python, uh, and they are asking if there's a website where they could use uh, packages like NumPy for Python. So the website I shared last uh, last time, Google Colab, uh, allows you to use uh, most of the popular packages. So they have NumPy, they have the matplotlib package that I use for plotting. So I would recommend you guys use uh, Google Colab if you don't want to install Python in your own computer. I think REPL IT also has NumPy. So uh, REPL IT should also be able to uh, to use NumPy by default, though. And that's what I'm hearing. There's also PyCharm. There's many tools available right nowadays. Um, Gonna answer okay. uh, so today I'm going to cover a different topic from last uh, compared to last time, but it's going to be um, the following set. So it's, it's the same overall topic. It's just not going to be the same slides as last time. Um, I'm going to mention some of the stuff that we did in project one. And I might go through some of the code of project one if you have questions about project one. Hey everybody. Um, so I'm here with Felipe. So just in case you don't know who I am, Raul Bersano, co-chair of the uh, Rises program. Um, I figured I would join for a couple of minutes and answer whatever questions people may have regarding the program overall. Um, I've gotten many emails from you. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that we are finalizing the mentor matching. So those of you that are interested in, in working with mentors, um, some of you have already been matched and should have had in been reached um, from by your mentors. If you haven't, that probably means that you have not been matched with your top choices, uh, except for the case that you are working with the nuclear mentoring program. Uh, we're trying to do something bigger and ambitious, and so that will require further time. We You may hear from us by tomorrow, if not early next week. Uh, so do not panic. And if you did not get matched with your top three, and that does not include the nu nuclear mentoring program, you may still join uh, the nuclear mentoring activities and we'll be sending uh, emails about that. Um, somebody said that you did not receive a response to your email two days ago. Uh, and you're saying that where else can you reach out? If you've emailed, the regis email that's because i'm the one receiving it so um i haven't been able to go through all the emails um i'm receiving in the order of 20 emails per day um and and i have a full-time job so um so maybe just ask me what is the question that you sent in the email and i can just answer it live unless it's very personal and then i uh, you know i will have you have to wait until i have a breathing time to go through the emails um somebody said that they did not 
attend the first class, all the all the videos are now available in YouTube. So everything is being streamed and recorded in YouTube. If you go to the YouTube page, which is uh, you can find at YouTube slash or uh, just go to YouTube and then search for regis dash stem um, and you will find the YouTube page. Just go ahead and register for that and you'll be able to see all the recordings. I've made a, a channel for the lecture series as well as the Python for STEM class. So if you did not attend the first class, I would encourage you to stick around for this class and then go watch the other one. And if anything didn't make sense from this class because it builds on the context of the previous one, then watch the video of this one, which is being recorded as we speak. Um, so do people get a, a certificate for participating in the program? Yes, you will be eligible to get a certificate. Um, we'll get back to you on the on the details of that later. But yes, everybody, including the mentors and mentees and participants will be able to get a certificate. Um, if a person had registered later than June 1st, uh, will they be matched? Uh, June 1st, I don't, what day are we in? <laughs> 29. Yeah, it, it, I don't think that would have been a problem. So if you, if you, um, basically, if you filled out a, a, a mentor register, if you filled out one of the forms that was dedicated to the mentoring program, then you're eligible to be matched. That does not mean that you will get matched, right? So you're eligible to get matched. Getting matched requires that the mentor agrees to work with you. And um, they may not choose to work with you, even though you might want to work with them. Uh, and so as part of the Regis team, we cannot uh, assure that anybody's going to get matched. We, we don't have that ability. We can't force mentors to work with people. Uh, and so all we can do is create the opportunity to you be to possibly be able to work with a mentor, but then that's up to you and the mentor uh, to your interest to to match. So, um, uh, so somebody asked if um, if the match list with mentoring programs is already out. Um, so so as I said already. Some mentors have already reached out to their mentees. Uh, I think that includes the majority of the mentors, if not all, with the exception of the nuclear mentoring program. And so if you have not heard from your mentor, that means that, that your mentor um, uh, may choose not to work with you. I've, um, I, they've been encouraged to uh, write an email to those that did not get matched, but that is not required. So I, I cannot, I, yeah, I cannot say. So if you have not heard from a mentor, there's a possibility that you have not been matched. As I said, there's still the possibility for you to work with uh, uh, nuclear mentoring folks. Uh, can you get a certificate if you only work with Python for STEM? Yes, absolutely. We don't put any restrictions on your involvement in the Regis program for you to get a certificate. Okay. Um, how can you increase the chances of you to get selected uh, next time if you did not get selected this time? That's a good question. Again, it's, it's very hard for me to answer that question because I don't um, define any criteria for the mentors to choose their mentees. Um, I can look into that. I could try to see what feedback I get from the mentors in terms of how they make the selection process so that perhaps is a little bit less of a black box. But at this point, the selection process is as much of a black box to me as it is for to you, because I, I, I really don't know what choosing to make their uh, selection process. We have um, 38 mentors and each one of them will choose different criteria. For example, I heard one that so that they will only work with people that are much more advanced in their academic careers, while others are willing to take people that are much more junior. So I, I, it depends on your interests and who you picked as a as a mentor. So I, I cannot say in general. In general, there might not be a simple rubric 
that you can follow to increase your chances. It might just be the stage of your career, your interest, what you wrote as a prompt for your your interest in that mentor. Um, I cannot say, sorry. So all we hope to do within the Regis program is just to increase the chances, but we cannot assure that everybody will be matched. But again, don't don't feel too sad about yourself. You you know you still have a consolation prize to hang out with me and the other nuclear mentoring folks. So, you know, I know that I'm not as cool as those that you wish you work with. You know, but uh, you know, um, I guess uh, beggars can't be choosers. So you're stuck with me. <laughs> um, how long are these speaker sessions for? Uh, this we'll have them for a few weeks, uh, and we'll have around three to five each week. I uh, don't know, uh, because I'm not managing the schedule, I don't know how many how many more um, talks we'll have. So there was no option to choose any mentor when I signed up for the regis. Is there any any other form for the mentoring programs? Yes, uh, so if you, if you register for regis, um, I personally put your email and, and I, I put, like 99.9% .9 of the emails <laughs> into an email list. And then once I put you in that email list, if you put your email correctly, then you should be receiving emails from me. If you put your email incorrectly, then there's no way that I, I you know, I, my, you know, I don't have magical powers, right? Uh, so if you put your email incorrectly, there's a chance that you're not receiving emails from me because I don't know what your real email is. But then after that, once you've been uh, uh, registered correctly, I've been emailing you, and among the things that I've emailed you is a is a is a link to the registration for the signing up for the mentoring program. That registration has already closed, so this is I'm talking about what I did in the past. So if you did not receive emails about this, either you sign up far too late, or uh, you didn't put your email correctly, or I don't know. I don't know what other possibilities there are. Okay, uh, there's another um, question about the nuclear mentoring program. Will it be open to all to start? Yes, it will be open to all to start. Um, my connection timed out for a few minutes, but is there a selection process done or not? Um, yes, and I explained that if you if you lost your connection, it's okay. The video is being recorded, so just go look back at the beginning of the video uh, in YouTube. Um, since when, so since when did it close? June 1st? No, I don't think so. I can't remember. I so think it was after that. When is the mentoring project going to start? It, oh, sorry. That was what the question was asking. Yeah. Um, it starts maybe next week. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you can't get the theme of this conversation. I'm juggling a lot of balls. <laughs> so hopefully next week. Uh, so what's the difference in pros and cons between Jupiter? That's, that's for you. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I think there's some more questions for me. Fantastic. Um, anyways, so I'll leave you with Felipe. Uh, you're in great hands. Also, you have Declan and Adriana in the call. Fantastic hands. So uh, you don't need me anymore, and I'm going to leave. All right. Okay. okay. Take care. Everybody. Thank you very much, Raul, for the for having us. And uh, so, I'm gonna begin uh, with the question uh, before I jump into my slides. So somebody asked the question about pros and cons between Jupyter Notebook and Google Colab. They say they use Jupyter, but then the files are saved locally, and so they're scared about what happens if your computer dies. So the answer is that. Uh, I would say that a big difference between, uh, just give me one second. Philip is on the side of the participants. He's one of our okay. TAs. Thank you. Philip, yeah, here you go. Um, so as I was saying, um, a, a big difference is that uh, Python Jupyter, as you install it locally, you can modify locally uh, 
the libraries. You can add libraries and you can modify ex explicitly which libraries are used by Jupyter. In Google Colab, you are you depend on what the designers and the engineers at Google are selecting to use as the libraries to use in Google Colab. There might be a ways to um to select more carefully what you want, but in general, uh, with Jupyter Notebook, you're gonna have a better better way to modify what exactly what exactly are the libraries that you're using. But then you're wondering about like saving your file. You can always have an, an extra system to back up your files like a Git repository, or even what I do is I save my files to my Google Drive uh, that I have installed. So technically I can open my files both in Jupyter and in Google Colab at the same time. And actually I'm gonna show you that at the end of this presentation today, because there's actually something that I cannot do with Google Colab that I can only do with Jupyter that I will show you at the end. Um, <clears throat> so given that, let's uh and given that we're talking already about the collab and the notebooks uh you were provided with a link to the notebooks so if you want you can go uh if you can split your screen something like that you have enough resources you can use the the notebook that i gave you for the project 1.5 and uh follow the presentation in there and play with the code as i uh, explain what the code is doing at the same time <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about some um, some topics that are related still to basic uh, operations on Python. So first of all, I'm going to uh, tell you about comments and how to get help immediately from within Jupyter or Google Colab. Then I'm going to talk about uh, what's called Boolean operations. Um, I'm going to talk about control flow tools and how to break them in a sense. So sometimes we don't want to just follow the the for loop or we don't want to just keep keep the while loop going we, we want to have some mechanism to break the normal way the the control flow tools work and there's in, there's ways implemented within every com, um programming language and specifically i'm going to show you how to do that with python there's a, an extra tool that i find very useful that's the append to to use with the python lists and then we're going to dive a little bit more onto uh, different numpy functions that we're going to use for our projects um, later. So let me begin with uh, comments. So as I mentioned last session, something that you want to really do if you are doing a, a code or you're programming something is to leave comments in the code so that you can come back later and uh, see what you did, see a quick explanation of what's happening and have some uh, way to also share your code with someone else and being able to, for the other person to be able to read the documentation, get a, a quick idea of how to use your code. So there's two ways to to have um, documentation in inside the code. So there is <clears throat> the um, the hashtag symbol. Uh, this uh, this is used uh, to generate comments. So you put it at the beginning of the line, and everything else after that is not going to be read by Python. So that's that's how you would write down uh, a comment. A uh, quick comment, you can also add it after uh, some piece of code and then everything after the hashtag is not going to be used by Python and it's it's going to be entirely a, a, a way to document what you're doing. If you want to have uh, a lot of text, sometimes it's annoying to have the same symbol over and over again in each line that you have a, a piece of text. So you can use the triple quotation marks um, to have a paragraph so that you don't have to to put the same symbol several times at the beginning of a line. <clears throat> so the triple quotation marks are also gonna be useful for functions because that's how you document a function. So if you want to have your function be able to use the help command that I'm gonna talk about later, then, is, then you need to use this triple quotation uh, for, for writing down the documentation. So if you have a, a, a a string of text that you forgot to comment for whatever reason, and then you try to run your program, Python is going to tell you there's something off. I see a lot of text. Uh, I don't know how to interpret that. And um, <clears throat> it's going to tell you invalid syntax. So so make sure you have your comments commented uh, with the appropriate syntax. Uh, so once we put the hashtag symbol, then everything's fine, and we can run our text, uh, our, our code. 
So second, um, if you need help, sometimes we want to to know a quick way to, to use a function. There's a function from some library or a function that we even ourselves defined, and we kind of forgot how to use it. So that's why there's a, a help function. So the help function takes as an input the name of the function. And so if you define a function and you put immediately after the definition, a paragraph that's uh, commented with the triple quotes. So in this case is, you know, a simple uh, comment about this function is to transform from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And then I run the help command. What I will be able to see uh, with the help command is exactly the signature of the function. So how many input variables does the function need? And then the paragraph that I wrote down for the for the description of the of the function. Uh, I can use this also for other types of functions for functions that are di directly from NumPy. So there's the append function from lists. And remember that lists are defined with these square brackets. So if I put this square bracket here and I put the help function, then it's gonna give me a help in, in that append function. Um, that works, that should work everywhere uh, that you can run Python on. The help is gonna print uh, that uh, the the, thing, the function signature. However, if you are in a notebook, there are even more ways to get help. Uh, so for example, if you are in a Google Core Lab notebook, you can write the function and type a question mark at the end of the name of the function and then run that piece of code. Um, <clears throat> So once you run that piece of code, an extra window is going to pop up, pop up in the right, and it's going to tell you the signature of the function, the, doc, the doc string, so that paragraph that I wrote after the function, and it's going to give you even more information. So this is going to be useful not only for functions, but also for variables. So like if you have a variable and you want to know like what's the value of the variable, what's the type of the variable, you can do the same thing where you type down the variable and then you add the question mark afterwards. Uh, that works in Google Colab, but that also works in Jupyter. A Jupyter notebook, you add the question mark and a window will pop up in the bottom saying you the same thing, the signature, the dot string, where it's defined and the type. In the different things will happen if you have the, instead of a function, you have a variable. So it's very useful to have help. Uh, remember to use these tools when you're programming because um, <clears throat> The way that you're gonna get better at programming is always to have some help and Jupyter and, and, and Google Colab have these quick ways to get information of on functions and variables. <clears throat> so let's get back to specifics of Python and how to code in Python. So uh, last time I talked to you about booleans and ifs uh, that are, be gonna, are gonna be useful to define uh, what to do in specific cases and what to do in other cases. And sometimes uh, you want to meet a condition. Sometimes you also want to meet several conditions at once. And for that, you could have several options. Something is called something that's called nested ifs. So you can ask if something happens. And then after that, if you can add a second if something else happens. And that works. However, there's also the option to use. Um, and and or and these are um, keywords from the Python uh, library the, that will immediately be able to do specific um, <clears throat> conditions of, of of boolean operations so that you don't have to have these nested ifs. So in this case, um, so here I'm going to be using everything that we learned in the first class. So I have the assignment operation on x1, the assignment operation on x2. So now my variables take the values of zero and two. Then I have a list. Uh, remember that lists are defined with square brackets and each of the elements of the list is uh, different from each other from using the comma. So a comma separates each of the elements of the list. And now um, I use a for keyword to begin a for a loop. So in a for loop, I define a variable x that's going to take the iteration. So x is going to change its value every time uh, the loop is traversed. In is the keyword to tell where to look for values for x. And then I'm telling it to look for values of x in this uh, list x test. 
Uh, then we have the semicolon that tells Python, this is where the, the block of code that is gonna be within the for loop is gonna begin. And then we have the identation. Remember, you have to ident ident some of the code if you want Python to know this is the part of the for loop that's gonna be repeatedly run when I'm, I'm in, inside the loop. Then I have the if, we talked about if last time, this is an, a conditional. And first I have a Boolean operation telling if X is bigger than X1 and also is smaller than X2. So if it's in the range inside X2 and X1 in between zero and two, then I print, well, in this case, it's just the obvious, right? It's greater than X1 and less than X2, sorry. <clears throat> And then I have a second condition. Uh, if the first one is not met, then it's gonna check for the second condition or after the first one is checked, it's gonna have to check for the second one. So there's, this is not an L if, this is a second if. So after checking the first one, it's gonna check the second one regardless of what happens. And the second one is gonna check if it's, if X is below X1 or if X is above X2. So we run this code and for X equals minus one, then we get that it's less than x1 or greater than x2. For x equals one, then it's within x1 and x2, x2, so the nth case. And for x equals three, we get that it's less than x1 or greater than x2. So the first and last cases gave the same result, uh, thanks to the fact that we can use the OR operation. <clears throat> so now let me go to control flow tools, how to break them sometimes. So let's say that you want to skip a specific iteration in a loop. There is a, you want to do a loop, for example, using the range function that I talked about last time. So the range function is gonna run from zero to the number at the at, uh, that I wrote here, except it's not gonna be inclusive. So it's gonna run from zero to 29. But for whatever reason, I don't want to, to do the X equals one case, right? So if you remember the for loop, has this control flow uh, structure. I enter into the loop. I check if the list is empty. If the list is not yet empty, I run some uh, block of code. And once the list is empty, then I exit the loop. But sometimes we want to continue uh, for specific cases. So the continue statement is gonna allow us to skip the code of block and go back to the empty the list question into the next iterable. So if I, for whatever reason, I'm gonna run through this range of variables, but I don't want to do anything on the case x equals one, I can put an if statement. If, uh, remember this is the Boolean comparison operator, if x is equal than one, then the semicolon again, and the identation, and we have the continue keyword. So once Python finds the continue keyword, instead of continuing, for the next stuff is going to go back immediately to the beginning of the for loop. So that's what this uh, blue arrow means, or uh, this red arrow means. There's sometimes uh, instances of a for loop that we want to finish it earlier because there's an extra condition that happens is most likely in a different variable than the one in the iterator because then we would have used a different iterator. But for this simple example, I'm just using the the, the iterator <clears throat> as our condition to break the loop. So when you have the keyword break, instead of going back to the beginning of the loop and checking the next iterator, it's gonna just forget about the iterations that had left and continue into the next part of the loop, into the next part of the code. So in this case, if I have if x bigger than three, again, semicolon in the identation, break, then once it, finds a value that's bigger than three, then it's gonna break and exit the for loop. So in this specific code, I have the continue condition, the break condition, and then if none of those conditions are met uh, and there's no continue or break, then I have a print statement. So when I look through here, what I'm gonna see is I'm gonna print the number zero. I'm gonna print the number two because when it's one, instead of going all the way to print, it continues back into X equals two. It prints the number three, but then once it gets the value of four, this condition is met and it breaks out of the for loop and nothing else happens. So those are useful um, uh, keywords that are gonna be able to have, allow you flexibility into your loops 
to have more complicated, handle more complicated cases. Uh, let me go now into what's the a function called append. Uh, this is very useful, especially when you are calculating things on a loop. So let's say I am uh, running through a loop and I am calculating a specific quantity and I want to save it uh, for each of the times I calculate this specific quantity. So last time we, we used uh, a similar example to this instead I was just printing it. Uh, but let's say I want to save the, the outcome of the cubic numbers smaller than 100. And then I'm going to use that later for whatever reason. So for that, I can initialize a list or begin the, a list with just the square brackets. They can be empty. That just means that my list has a length of zero. And, uh, and then later, what I will do is on the list, I'm going to use the, the function append and put in the non cubed So something that we said at the beginning is that I wasn't going to use a lot of jargon, but uh, just to make an example of uh, or, and explain why is the reasoning of this type of, of syntax is that this type of syntax is, is what's called object-oriented programming. And append is a method of the class that's called list. So list is a class in Python. It's a type of variable. And it has functions within this class that apply only to this class. Uh, and that's uh, called a method. So that's a little bit of jargon, but just so, so you understand why we have to use the list and put this dot after the list, and then the function can be called. So this is different from previous functions that we have seen, like the print function where you use the name of the function and then the parentheses and then the input variables. In this case, append is directly uh, is a function that can be only used for lists. So you can only use it for a variable that has a list inside it. And what this does is um, it's going to add a value at the end of the list so that it's going to increase the length of your list. So we can go through the code slowly here. I initialize my list empty. I initialize a variable that shows the number one. I raise uh, this number to the power three. And I'm calling that number Q. And then I'm going to tell Python, OK, this is the while loop. So it's going to exit the loop only until the condition is met. Is, is met. Uh, here I have num cubed and checking if it's less than 100. The semicolon again and the indentation to tell it that this is part of the of the loop. And I'm going to append the num cube. So in, in the first case, I'm going to append 1. Then I'm adding 1 to number. So remember, this is the assignation uh, command that takes the original value, it adds one, and then it saves it to the same variable. So num becomes two, it was one, but now it's two. And then num cube is still the, the number raised to the power tree. And then I go back, I check if it's bigger than 100, and I repeat the process until the condition is met. And once I exit the, the loop, I'm gonna print the value of list. So what happens is that list now becomes 1,8,27,64. Uh, the next cube number is 125, but that's uh, bigger than 100. So that's why it didn't get uh, saved into the list. Okay. Um, there's other ways to use lists. Um, not only the append function exists, there's other functions that um, you can find in the documentation. Uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, also tell you that there's a way to access individual elements of your list. This is using the square brackets. I did mention that last time, but I'm going to emphasize that here. So you use the square bracket. And notice that the, um, the counting of, of the elements begins in zero. Python is a zero-based language, so the counting begins in zero. So if I want to access the first element, I use zero. And then I can access elements from the back of the lists by using negative indexes. So remember, my list was 1827.64. And if I print the zero element, that's the first element, and the minus one element, I print 1 and 64, because that's the first and the last element of my list. <clears throat> um, then this is a second example where I'm going through a loop uh, inside a list, and I'm doing a specific uh, operation and then appending that to a second list. So if I, um, for, for this specific example, you can see that you can use 
the list that we defined earlier as an iterator for a second for loop. There's faster ways to do this once we use NumPy, but this is obviously for an example to see how, how you can append to lists. Okay. So what are the better ways to do this specifically for mathematical operations? And that's gonna be using what uh, the, the lists or a version of lists that NumPy defines that are called arrays. So as I mentioned earlier, in order to use a library, you have to import the library. You, you use the keyword import, the name of the library. And then sometimes because you want to use this library repeatedly throughout your code, you can have a shorthand for the name of the library. And that's by using the as a keyword and adding NP um, uh, as the shorthand. So you define the shorthand to whatever you want. Customarily, people use NP for NumPy, PLT for um, Matplotlib, Pyplot, and so on. But in principle, you can add any keyword, any shorthand that you want. That's not defined as another variable here. So to create an array, we can use a list that we have created earlier. Uh, so for that, we use NP dot. So that's telling we are going to access something that's defined inside NP. And then array is the function that creates arrays, basically. And so you can create an array with an already existing list. And notice that once we print the array, it's going to look slightly different than the list um, because Python inside knows that they are different things. They have different types, even though they contain the same elements. So the way that arrays look like is, is just like, is, is a space between the different elements, whereas list makes this explicit comment, uh, writes explicit comment to differentiate between different elements. And the notation of array, I think it's made so that it looks like a vector that you write down um, by hand because uh, these arrays are, are optimized to use, uh, to do vector operations. <clears throat> So earlier I showed you that you can use a for loop to apply a, an operation within a list. But then if you want to apply an operation to an array, uh, NumPy is, is built in a way that you can, on, you can directly apply the operation to the array and you don't have to loop through the elements of the array and apply the operation for each of them. So that's gonna save you time in the sense that you don't have to type. Uh, the for loop, but it's also uh, an optimized uh, statement. So then it, it also saves you uh, computing time because of the way this is uh, built within Python. Uh, so the functions inside NumPy can receive lists as input. They will automatically transform them to arrays and then use them for the function, or they can also use the, the arrays that are, are designed by NumPy. Um, so you see, if I use the sign function, this is a trigonometric sign function with list one or with array one, since the two of them have the same uh, elements, then when I print the result of one and two, I get the same answer for both of them. But notice that now result one and result two, none of them has commas, which means that both of them are arrays. So even though I put in as an input a list into a NumPy function, uh, notice that you will always get as an output an array within NumPy. <clears throat> you can also create matrices. And uh, so that was useful for the last um, project where we had this um, mass matrix. And in order to create a matrix, what you can do is uh, a list of lists. So for example, you would have for each row in your, in your matrix, you would have a list. And so in this case, the, the syntax that you should be reading is that this list is uh, initialized with square brackets. And then the first element is itself a list because it has the square brackets. And that list has the values one and zero. Then the second element is also a list and that has the element zero and minus one. And then I can pass that to NumPy array. It's gonna do what, uh, what it did with the vectors and it's gonna create a matrix instead because this has two dimensions. So when I print it, it's gonna look like a square matrix because it's it has uh, the geometry of, of two by two, of a two by two matrix. So you print the map, you see something like a square matrix of so one, zero, zero, minus one. And remember, if you print the list, then you're gonna just see uh, something very similar to what you typed with the square brackets and the commas. <clears throat> 
Uh, something that you should remember about is that when you reuse variables, then Python is going to forget about the variable that it, um, the, the value of that variable that was defined earlier. So earlier we had lists defined with the with these elements. And now for just to make this example, I'm renaming it to, to these values. So when I print list two, now it has this specific value and it completely forgot the values that I calculated earlier. So sometimes that could be annoying if you forget uh, that you have already used a variable and then you um, rewrite a variable, you will lose the values that you could have uh, hard, uh, you can have worked very hard to calculate. So you have to be very careful with these types of things. Um, so now let's uh, let's do something more interesting with, um, with the NumPy arrays. So with the number arrays, as I mentioned earlier, we can define these vectors. Um, so these arrays are in some sense, some kind of vector. So here I'm defining this vector with 0.6 minus three as elements. And then I'm using the dot uh, function of NumPy. And the dot function of NumPy is gonna calculate what's called the inner product. So this is the normal matrix uh, vector multiplication that you, you, should, um, you should be familiar from mathematics in high school, I, I believe. So, I showed you what the value of mat one was earlier. So I have it here for reference. So it's just this almost uh, diagonal matrix that has the elements one and minus one. So if you make the matrix multiplication, you should be able to see that the result should be 0.6 and 0.3. So it's just gonna change the sign of the second value of your, of your vector. So vector two is precisely this, the dot of mat and vector. So you print it and you get 0.6. And then I'm also gonna print the value of the dot between vector two and vector one. So what is that? Um, so this is still the inner product, which means you take one of the vectors, it automatically transposes it so that it can be uh, taken the inner product with, with the other vector. Uh, you multiply uh, 0.6 times 0.6, you get 0.36. You multiply 0.3 times minus 0.3, you, you get minus 0.09. So you should get 0.27, which is precisely what Python uh, is telling us. So these are very useful um, functions when you have to do some kind of linear algebra. Um, so earlier I mentioned that sometimes a mistake, um, if you're not careful enough, you could be rewriting a variable or you could be defining certain things more than once. And uh, in order to check what you if what you didn't did is right, uh, you can reinitialize your Jupyter Notebook or your Google Colab. So this doesn't apply if you're running in, in a script, for example, because a script is going to be run one time and then it's gonna, not going to save the variables forever. But sometimes if you're running a notebook, for example, you can write a definition of a variable, run that code, and then don't like that piece of code, erase it. And then, some, and then you might think that that variable is gone. But technically, since you're still running the same notebook, that variables is still saved somewhere. So you could be um, by mistake using a variable that's not defined anymore. So in order to prevent that to happen or just to begin the running of your code from scratch, then you can restart the runtime. Uh, so that's done with runtime in the runtime menu in Google Colab and restart runtime. Or if you're in Jupyter, then in the kernel menu, and then there's the restart option. <clears throat> Um, so let me go back to the first project with all the um, information I'm, I did this time about um, the Boolean operations and the different things that, that we learned today. Some of the things in, in project one should be uh, easier to follow now. Uh, since I introduced some of the, some stuff last time in the project that we didn't actually learn. But let me go back to the code again. Um, <clears throat> so remember, first thing that we need to do, some, or it's it's best to do it at the beginning, is import the libraries that you're gonna use. That way, uh, you know which specific code is being used in in this specific notebook. So it's good practice to import the libraries at the beginning. And remember to run the code. I do uh, shift enter, and then in this case, it's, it's gonna be. Um, 
slowly at the beginning because this is the first thing of code I run, but then the tick mark tells me that it ran properly. So remember last time what we did, we had two marbles that were gonna collide against each other. And we wanted to know the velocity and the trajectory of the two marbles after the collision. And for those marbles, we knew the masses, their velocities and their initial positions. So, so let's say I'm gonna give the initial positions 10 and minus 10 to the red and the blue marble. Then I'm gonna let one marble be at rest and then the other marble will come with a speed of 1.8 centimeters per second so this is just an example um but then we can make something interesting and this is what happens if the two marbles have the same mass so just to go through the codes quickly and uh i'm just initializing variables i'm putting them into a list because that's going to be handy later the velocity is also going to be a vector uh, so the velocity of the red, the blue marble, and I'm going to put that in, in a vector. Then the masses, uh, I'm going to initialize the masses. I'm, I'm, you can see I have extra lines of comment, extra blocks of comment to make sure that I know what I'm doing. Some usual shorthand variables, the sum of the two masses, the difference between the two masses. And then if you remember last time I had to define a mass matrix. So as I said earlier, to define this mass matrix, I have a list of lists. So this is a square two by two matrix. So the list begins with a list of two elements, comma for the second element, that's also a list. And each of these lists has two elements. And uh, if you want to see where the definition of this matrix is, you can go back and see the video from, from the last session where I define uh, and the equations and I solve them to check that this is the what we need. Um, so then I can, you know, print this mass matrix just to see how it looks like. Uh, you can immediately see the, this has a very symmetric property. So since the two masses are the same, you would expect that this matrix is going to behave at least in a symmetric way. And we indeed see that it looks like it's going to be symmetric uh, across this diagonal. <clears throat> to get the final velocities, what we did uh, last time was we need the, the multiplication of the mass matrix times the velocity. Uh, the, the first, the initial velocities. So we can get that the velocity of the red marble after the collision is 1.8 and the blue marble is zero. So that's the opposite of what we began with. So the red marble began at rest and the blue marble with a, began with a velocity of 1.8. And then the red marble now has the velocity of 1.8 and the blue marble has the, the, the zero velocity. <clears throat> so I can ask when they collide. Um, for that, I did this uh, division between the initial positions and the, the velocity between the two marbles. That's just time is equal to distance over velocity. So that's how I know when are they going to collide. I define a function. I put uh, the documentation in this function that's going to determine the position t seconds after being at the, at t at x0,0 zero, zero, and traveling with a velocity v0,0. Zero, zero. So I define this function that is going to be um, it's going to be handy later. So for example, if I want to know the, the position of the collision, then I use the initial variables, uh, the x0, the velocity 0. And I know that it's going to be in the collision position at the collision time. So I can check that the collision position is at, uh, at x equals 10. And then I'm going to do this loop where I have 100 time steps so to have time steps, I use the lean space, linear space function within uh, NumPy. So you can see that Google Collaborator is very is very handy because you you are over the the function and tells you everything about um, about the function. Okay, so we're going to define this list, this empty list, to have the position. And um, as I said earlier, the way that we fill this list is by using the append function. So by appending the calculation of the, the position before and after the collision. So last time I told you we're gonna iterate through the time. So that's what the four is. And if we're before the collision time, we're gonna use the initial position and initial velocities. If we are after the collision time, that's why the else is here, then the position is calculated um, from the colliding position, the final velocity, 
and then the time is the time in between the current time and the colliding colliding time because we're beginning at the colliding position. So I run this. I can get um, <clears throat> the values for for the position of the red and the mar and the blue marble as a function of time, and then I can plot the result. So here in the plot, um, to plot, I'm using uh, matplotlib. So the, the the way that you plot with matplotlib is you you have the the plot command. It has the x values, the y values, and then this is to tell it to draw it with a red line. So the red marble is drawn with red, the blue marble is drawn with blue. Then we can add a title to make it a little prettier. The label in the x axis, the label in the y axis. So the x axis is time because that's what we're putting plot. The y axis is the position, that's the the y. And then we're adding a legend so that <clears throat> we know that. The first one is the red marble, the first one we plot. Second is the blue marble. If the colors weren't, uh, you know, weren't giving us enough information already. Uh, this type laid out just is an aesthetical cho choice to, to make the final figure a little bit prettier. It's completely optional. And then if you want to save your figure, then there's the save fig command. You, you put the name of the, of the file that you want it to save it for to. And this 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 second option is also uh, an aesthetic choice that is completely optional. But so let's just see. Um, let's dive into the the physics here a little bit. So what I said earlier is that the masses of the two marbles are the same, um, but one of them is at rest at the beginning. So as time passes by, it just stays stationary. The second one is moving with a velocity of one point eight towards the second marble. So as the blue marble approaches, it collides with the marble and something happens here. Um, where the blue marble is stays stationary now and the red marble moves. So if you remember, the, the way that we solved this was by demanding that there was energy and momentum conservation. So the energy at the beginning is a, red, a blue marble that has a mass of three that's moving with a certain speed. And so at the end, the energy has to be conserved so if the initial energy was from a marble of mass three, then in, if a final marble is still moving with the same mass and the same velocity, of course, the energy is going to be conserved. And the way that, <clears throat> and then the momentum of the initial marble was this three times um, the velocity. And by hitting the second marble is um, passing the momentum to the second, mar to, the, to the red marble. But since both of them have the same mass, it has to completely pass all its momentum. Different things will happen if, for example, let's say both of them were traveling at each other with the same speed. You would expect that since the problem is completely symmetrical, the answer should still be symmetrical, uh, or the, uh, the, be the behavior after the collision should still be symmetrical. And that's exactly what you will see. Both marbles approach each other with the same mass, with the same velocity. They hit each other, and they basically bounce and get the final velocity uh, reversed from their initial velocity. So um, this is a, a nice, a nice way to visualize the conservation of momentum and velocity. And you can play around with the masses, see if if you have a smaller mass, then. Uh, the, the collision is not going to look as symmetric as before. Uh, one of the one of the marbles in this case, um, I, I think this is a big coincidence. Uh, I hit uh, exactly the value so that the velocity is completely transferred to the blue marble, and so the red marble is going to stay stationary after the collision. Uh, and you can play with this uh, if if you want to see more about collisions and momentum. So let me move to the second project that we have prepared. Um, so for the second project, this is going to be a, a different, uh, uh, still going to be uh, related to, to Newtonian mechanics, some uh, trajectory of, of projectiles in this case. <clears throat> so let's say um, we're designing like a game where somebody has to shoot a uh, projectile and has to land on a target, but there's going to be a, an obstacle in the middle. So in this case, I'm, I'm just drawing a blue 
square for the obstacle. So the, the player is going to tell you the angle of the projectile, the initial velocity. And from that, we need to determine if they hit the target and to know if the, if the projectile was stopped beforehand by the, um, by the obstacle. So let me run through uh, the group of programming techniques before we go into how to implement this. So remember, we want to identify and bound goals. First, we want to write some pseudo code and prototypes. That way, uh, we have some guidance uh, when we're actually writing down the, the in the programming language that is more like a computer level language. Uh, something that's always useful is to have some diagrams, some flowcharts, um, and that is is a good practice to help you write code. Remember to write comments, document your code, so that when you come back later, you you know what you did and why you did what you, what you did. As if you can split your code in different pieces, it is useful because you can reuse some of the pieces later for different code, or you can change a piece of code without altering the rest of the, of the code and having the rest of the code work nicely, even if you update a certain function. You want to exploit visualizations because this is an easier way to check uh, all the cases that you can, uh, you can uh, check, for example, like a variable, what all the values that it's taking instead of checking specific numbers. And then you can validate with known examples and limited cases. So some you want to make sure that uh, your code at least works in the in the easiest case scenario. And that's a way to, to expect it to work in, in harder cases. So here we have to identify the goals and 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 for and and that's basically to know the trajectory of our projectile, to know if it hits a target. So we want to know also if it's stopped in the middle by an obstacle. Uh, so for that, we need to know the position of the projectile as a function of time, be checking if it's outside the obstacle, and then check when it lands and check if it lands in our target. And for that, we're going to use uh, the projectile motion equations. So for the horizontal, uh, for the um, <clears throat> for the vertical motion, the, the equation that is used is is the is the following you have the initial position the velocity in the y direction so in the vertical direction and this uh, multiplied by time and then the constant of gravity uh is gonna pull the object uh towards the negative uh, direction so this uh the second term in the the third term of the equation is proportional to the constant of gravity and goes as time squared for so this is the the classical equation for accelerated uh, motion for the uh, movement in the x-axis then we have um just uniform motion which means that whatever the initial position is plus the velocity times time which is the, the what we're, we're using for our marbles earlier that's going to give you the horizontal axis uh, position we of course know the value of the gravity constant, you know, 9.81, but 9.8 should be good enough for this demonstration. And then to know the uh, the value of the velocity in the horizontal and vertical direction. So in the vertical y and the horizontal direction, we use the trigonometric functions sine and cosine. So that this is gonna be a function of, of the total velocity times the sine of the angle or the cosine of the angle respectively. Um, so one thing that we want to, my wonder is, okay, so we know how long the projectile is on the air. We know when to ask the final horizontal position to know if we hit the target. Um, and for that you use, um, <clears throat> uh, you can, you can use this second equation, this, this, this first equation for the vertical motion. And you demand that the, the X is equal to the initial, the Y is equal to the initial Y and ask what the time is. So this is gonna give you a second order equation. Uh, this, was, this is gonna have two solutions. One of the solution is the trivial zero. So the, the, the vertical position is the initial position at the beginning, but it's also gonna give you a second solution that's gonna give you the total time of flight. So in this case, you solve this, you're gonna get that it's twice the velocity divided by the, uh, the strength of gravity. 
Um, so now that we have the equations that we're going to use, then we can write uh, our pseudo code. Uh, so what are we going to begin with? So we have to initialize some constants. That is the the gravity, the the position of the the obstacle, the target location, obviously the the velocity and the angle. And then we're going to calculate the velocity in the x and y uh, components. So the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity. We are going to determine the time of flight because that's going to tell us how many, how, mo how long should we be tracking the, the flight of the projectile. And then we're going to determine that position along the time, right? That's how we will know if we, will, we are going to hit the obstacle or not. Uh, so while we're determining the position a long time, we're going to check if we have crashed against the obstacle. Uh, finally, we're going to check if we hit the target after uh, the time of flight. And we want to visualize the results to, me, to be able to make sure that what we're doing makes sense. Um, so as earlier, we can write a, a flow chart. So you, you initialize the constants, calculate the specific variables, as I said before. Uh, something that you want to do is create an array with time and then go inside it to a for loop and check into the, the array time to, to see if the time is, um, if the array is already empty to exit the, the, the loop. If it's not empty, what well, we want to ask if it is that if we have crashed or not. If we have crashed, if we haven't crashed, if crashed is false, then we calculate the, the position on the next uh, time and then we repeat the loop for time. Once we finish uh, all the way to T total or the time of flight, um, we're gonna exit. Also, if we crash, if crash is true, we're gonna also exit the, the loop. And then at the end, we're gonna check if we hit the target. Of course, if we crash, then we didn't hit the target and then visualize the results. Uh, so here, for example, for crash, we can use the break keyword statement that I talked about at the beginning. <clears throat> and this is just the repetition of the cell code. Okay, so let, let us see the code. Uh, so this is project number two. Let's see. So here I have the, the notebook with project two in Google Colab. Uh, so we begin with the constants, as I said earlier. Uh, we begin with the constants. Okay, it's running. We have um, we define the obstacle to be in some some position. So here I have like a diagram of what I'm thinking the obstacle the obstacle is. So I'm saying the x of the x initial of the obstacle is four, the x final of the obstacle is six, and then the height of the obstacle is two. So it looks more like a square here since it's a uh, has a length to height to, but you know, then this is more or less the idea. So we have our obstacle, and then I'm gonna tell it that the target is um, begins uh, the target position begins at ten, and the final target position is ten point five. So it's ten meters away from us, and the target is a length of 0.5. So I'm just gonna tell it if it lands within this area, that it means uh, you hit the target, just based on the on the horizontal position of the projectile at the end. Uh, so here's where we begin the actual game. Uh, we can have a definition for the velocity and the angle. So the velocity is going to be 15 uh, meters per second. The angle is going to be 30 degrees. And then as I said earlier, if we want to calculate uh, the velocities, I, I need to use um, the decomposition formula. <laughs> so something that you have to take into account is that NumPy uses radians by default, and I'm writing the angle here in in, in, the, in degrees. So this is this will be a good comment, for example, to, to make here. So the angle is in degrees. To remind yourself that the code takes that into account later. Uh, and so we take the initial angle that we provided. Multiply by pi and divide by 180. That's how we change from degrees uh, to radians. And then we can use this inside of the cosine and sine function. So we just apply this function that I have here. 
So the velocity in the x position is the velocity provided times the cosine of the angle and same for the y. So we run this piece of code. Then the second thing that I told you we could calculate is the total time, which is twice the velocity in the vertical direction divided by gravity. I'm confident that the, in this case, the projectile flies uh, around a second and a half. Um, so now we create an array. Uh, let me show you the, the flow chart. So we calculated the Vx, Vy, we calculated the total, and now we create an array with time. So how many time steps are we gonna calculate? So let's, let's begin calculating 100 time steps for that I create a lean space that runs from zero to a hundred uh, to the t total, so 1.5 in and has this number of time steps, a hundred time steps. So notice that I could have as well used this hundred directly here, uh, but this is a nicer way to do it in the sense that I define a variable that has uh, a name that could be used later to remember what this variable is doing. And then later we have to reuse this variable somewhere is in the code, I, I can just reuse this and not have to change the, this number everywhere else in the code. So now we can calculate the projectile tra uh, tra trajectory. So this is the, the for loop in the flow chart. So we begin with the initial positions at zero. So, so this is just conventional. It's just defining the coordinate system. So we're just saying the projectile begins at zero comma zero for X and Y, and then we loop in the time array. And what we do is use this equation that I said earlier. So x is going to be the initial position plus the velocity on x times t. And same with y, the initial y position, the velocity on y times time minus gravity times time to the power 2. So remember in Python to use the power op operation to raise something to a power, we use the two star symbol and then divide it by two. And all of this is gonna be appended into the white list. Something that we want to check is if we have uh, hit the obstacle. So for that, we have already calculated X. Uh, so technically here in the code, I actually have these two blocks of code reversed, um, but it should work uh, in a similar way. Um, so I'm gonna check if the last value of X has crashed against the obstacle. So. So here I have, I'm accessing the last element of X by using the minus one. So remember the indexing, you can access the, the last elements with, with the negative number. Um, so the, so if, if the position in X is between, is bigger than the initial position of the obstacle and the final position of the obstacle. So that's where I'm using the ANTH keyboard. And also the height of the projectile is less than the height of the obstacle, then it's for sure that we hit the obstacle. So if we hit the obstacle, then we break, right? We crash, we break, we exit the, the loop. We shouldn't be traveling anymore. Um, and then at the end, we check if the projectile hit the target. So if the last position in X is within the positions of the target, so if it's bigger than the initial position and smaller than the final position, it should be XF. This was a small error in the code. Um, then we know that we hit the target. Otherwise, then we miss the target and game over. Uh, so now that I explained, then we can run the code. And then we find that, oh no, we crashed against the obstacle. So we missed the target. To see what happened, uh, then we can do a visualization. Why did we hit the target and when did we hit it, right? So in the visualizations works the same. Uh, here's an extra command that is just for uh, whenever you have multiple visualizations, uh, you can uh, name each of the plots that you have and then reuse them later, for example. And so I'm, I'm just labeling this plot as the figure one. So you, you use the figure command and then this is just telling it this is the first figure. Later I can, I can use figure number two. <clears throat> and then uh, I'm going to plot the X and Y positions, uh, paint them in blue. 
Uh, just for the visualization, we can add a, a, a horizontal line. So AX, H line is going to add a horizontal line. So, oh, yeah. Google Colab is very useful. I can just I put my mouse here, and then it's going to tell me this function adds a horizontal line. And the default variable is x equals 0. And then I'm just coloring with uh, k, which means for Python or PyPlot, this is the color black. Then we're going to draw the obstacle. And for that, I'm going to draw a square. So the positions of the square are the, um, I'm going to draw it from the bottom to the top. So from x4 to uh, at y equals 0, then I stay in the same four, but then I go up to the height. I move on x, I stay on the same height, I stay on the same x, and then I go back to zero. So that should draw our obstacle. And then we highlight the tar target too. So I put it at least with the values of x at the beginning, at the end. Uh, I put it at zero height, and then I highlight it with color red. So let's see our visualization. Mm, okay, something here. I need to change to see the visualization. Mm, we're gonna talk about this in a second, but this is just to make the visualization work now. Does it? Mm, okay, it's not working right now. So let's restart, as I said earlier. And maybe that should fix the visualization. We restart the whole code. We can also tell um, if I place myself here, tell run, um, run before. So everything up, 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 up until here is going to be run. And then we can run the visualization again. Here it, it goes. Now it worked. Uh, so we see, we shoot, and then we hit the obstacle, so we didn't arrive to the target. What do we need to do if we want to hit the target? Probably uh, a bigger angle could work. So let's say we do 45 for the angle, 45 degrees. Maybe that's going to be good enough to hit the target. Let's see, you missed the target, game over. Okay, so 45 degrees, yeah, that overshoots the target by a lot. Um, but you know, now you can play with it. Something that you can notice also is uh, the variable time steps that we defined earlier. It's going to make our code be able to do something um, funny that you sometimes see on video games where you can, uh, for example, go through objects that you shouldn't be able to go through. So let's say we put only five time steps. So that's very few time steps, right? If we're gonna go from zero to time total in only five time steps, uh, we're not gonna calculate the position at a lot of places. Uh, so I I have the angle at 30, but it didn't tell me that we hit the target. That's funny because it helped, told me that we hit the target earlier. So what's happened? So we see the visualization and see what happens. We're evaluating the position here, 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 and here. So in this case, our uh, projectile was able to teleport through the obstacle just because we don't have enough time steps. And this is a common bug that could happen in a, in a video game that doesn't have enough memory to calculate every time step. And so sometimes you can go through objects by mistake. And sometimes, and this is something that you can play with uh, more. Um, you can also do an animation. So I, here I added a piece of code to do an animation. Sadly, uh, Google Colab doesn't allow you to do animations anymore. And that's why I'm also running this same thing. So this is the same file. I have it open on Google Colab, but I also have it open on, on Jupyter. Uh, and that's what I said earlier, that you can, you can have a file, and this same file is going to be able to be opened by Jupyter and by uh, Google Colab. So you can be able to have the best of both worlds in that you can run it sometimes with the Google Colab online, save it in Google Drive and have it backed up. And also you can download that and run it locally um, in Jupyter. So same, we define constants, 
position, target, everything we did before. Uh, here I'm gonna do, let's say the first five time steps we did earlier. Uh, the visualization is as before, but now I also can run the animation. And in this animation, we're just seeing the trajectory of, of the projector. Uh, so if you want to know more about the animation, I leave the code in the in the uh, in the notebook. You can go through it, experiment through that, and see why the animation works. Uh, this uh, small error that I have. Don't worry, you shouldn't see that when you run your. Um, so you know we can we can add more time steps to make the animation a little bit more interesting. In this case, it's running quite slow. So then we can change this interval, I think, to make it run faster. Yeah. So you see the project down, and boom, it hits uh, the obstacle. OK. Um, so I think that's all from me today. Uh, as I said, you can play with this. You can play with the angle, with the speed. If you have uh, Jupiter, you can also play with the animation. Uh, the time step, if time steps is too small, we can avoid the obstacle by teleporting through it. Uh, this is what's commonly known as a bug in a, a computer code. Uh, so that's all for this presentation. If you have any more questions, I can stick around for another five minutes to uh, try to answer more more of the of the questions, and then. For everyone else, thanks for joining today, and we will see you here next week. <clears throat> uh, so somebody is asking that they have a problem with uh, the definition of PLT. So just make sure that you're defining this as PLT, and just make sure that you at least run the cell once. And then you should be able to reuse PLT every time. That you that you have it. Um, what else? Uh, also, I just want to say thanks again um, for joining as uh, TAs. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, Philip. I think Adriana. Let's see her here, but uh, I will make sure to say thanks to her too. Thanks everyone who joined and we will see you here next week uh, with the next project. Again, if you want to rerun something, you can go to the YouTube webpage and then also you have access to these uh, Jupyter notebooks that you can run on Google Colab and play with them at your own pace. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat or the Q&A. Let's see. Let's see if I can hit the target in the meantime. Um, I guess bigger angle, smaller velocity. Oh, nice. 
Oh, but it didn't work. Aha. Uh -huh. Because this still has 